Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Self Helpless. I'm Kelsey Cook. I'm Delaney Fisher. And today we're going to be doing an episode on our priorities in our 20s versus our 30s. Yes. And the shifts that have happened. Last yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we are wise old women of the forest. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we're just a few years into the 30s. I know. Listen, we know all about the 30s. We're like mm, 20, 30% there. <laughs> I know. But I really do think that there's something, people talk about that, that in your 30s, it's like that curve of oh, growth yeah. and knowledge really picks yes. up fast. Oh, yeah. I, I feel like a completely different person. I, I Like I've said many times, I don't think I would hang out with 20-something Delaney. <laughs> like, don't you something cringe? The way I would want to stay far fucking away from that girl. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, it's 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 pretty crazy the differences. So, um, this is coming out on Halloween. Happy Halloween to everybody. Um, I am headlining the Punchline Comedy Club in Atlanta this weekend, November fourth through the sixth, and then all of my uh, upcoming twenty twenty three tour dates. So the kind of the first like half of next year, everything's up on my website. We've got. Providence, Raleigh, Philly, Portland, Cincinnati, Minneapolis, Chicago, um, Uncasville, uh, Denver, so many things, so many things coming up. So yes. So please um, go to KelseyCook.com. Our lovely friend Patrick redesigned my website and revamped it. And it's just looking awesome now. So go check it out. Love that man so much. He literally- has changed my life. He's always, he has done literally every single thing when it comes to graphic design of any business I've ever had. And he introduced me to my husband. He's like, he's like, like, I know you're like, you're a graphic designer, but you're also like my life coach. It's great. (laughs) You're also like my fairy godmother. Yeah. He's, (laughs) he is wonderful. So, um, Yeah, check out KelseyCook.com. Get those tickets. How about you, Del? Awesome. Um, you know, I have a, a podcast called the Minimalist Business Podcast. It is a private podcast, but it's completely free. And you can sign up to receive it at DelaneyFisher.com. Uh, you can get them the episodes delivered straight to your inbox. You can connect it to your phone, listen on your computer, whatever device you have. And yeah, we talk about all kinds of stuff, basically scaling your business with simplicity. So you have, you know, you're increasing your revenue, but you're also reclaiming your time and having plenty of free time. It's all about financial freedom over there, time freedom, all that shit. So yeah, come on over. We'd love to have you. So much fun. I love it. Those two things are just the recipe for delicious, happy life. Yes. Yeah. Deliciousness. Yes. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But I'm very excited. I mean, the, the people that I've been meeting with who are finding out about the podcast and like joining that space, they just do the coolest shit. You know, it's really about like unconventional entrepreneurs and I meet people all the time. I'm like, wow, I cannot believe that you can do that for a living. It's so, yes. so cool. The, the things yeah. that people do. So I love it. Yeah. So cool. cool. Um, all right. You want to hop into this topic? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. We both assembled some lists. Sure. I would say um, the biggest thing that popped up for me was the shifts in like where friendships are on my priority list now. I think oh. that that has been the biggest, I think, difference because when I think about like being in my 20s or being younger, I feel like it was okay, get your schoolwork done or, you know, make sure your bills are paid and then hang out with my friends. Like that was just like number two. (laughs) Oh yeah. Same. Yeah. Yes. And now, now that I'm in my thirties or, you know, I'm getting older, there's just so many things. It's not that my friendships are not extremely important to me. They are, but there's just so many things, um, above that now where it's like, I prioritize my health and time with my husband and my family and like my Mm. business and his work. And then it's like friendship. So I feel like you know, it used to be like a number two thing. And now it's like a, maybe a f- number five. And, um, I've had to be like really intentional with like the, the quality of the relationships I have versus the quantity, because yeah. there's just limited time. And, and so that one I think has been 
the biggest shift. And that's the first thing that came up to me that was like very much night and day. What about you, Kels? What was like the first, like the first thing? Yeah. The first thing for me, and, and I don't know that my list is necessarily going to be just like priority changes. It, a lot of it is also just lessons I've learned. Um, the first, the very first thing that came up for me was my relationship with anxiety and kind of that correlation with hormonal birth control. But, uh, you guys know, if you've listened to the show before that I was on the birth control pill for 12 years, got off of it when I was, I believe 30. And I had previously thought that who, who I was throughout my twenties was kind of who I was always going to be. Mm. I looked at anxiety as just like, oh, this is just who I am. And then getting off of the pill and maybe also just, I don't know, just growing up, getting older, but I really think getting off the pill had a lot to do with it, that uh, my anxiety has changed so much. And I I guess I just wanted to emphasize that if you are somebody who is in your 20s or if you're somebody who is on the birth control pill and you, you feel like it's not the right fit for you anymore, I, I just would encourage you to look at other options because I really didn't. Um, I didn't realize how much it was impacting me emotionally. And now if you struggle with anxiety, I know for me, a lot of it was ruminating and where I would, it's like, I always had something in the queue to like, there was never a time that I wasn't worried about at least one thing. And most of the time it was more than one thing at once. And Once I would maybe work myself to a point where I could let one thing go, it would immediately get replaced with a new piece of anxiety. And it felt like I had really dug those pathways deep in my brain that that was how my brain dealt with things. And now it's so funny. Something will pop up for me that gives me a little anxiety where I'm like, ooh, I'm worried about that. And then I like chew on it for just a little And then I just let it go. And I can't, I I just want to give some hope to people that are struggling with it. And also I know that there are so many medications available out there too, if that's an option that you feel like would be the right fit for you. Um, But I just have been so happy to find out that anxiety is not my identity. And that if you are struggling with that, to know that it can get better and I never thought it would. And it it has, and it's a really, really great feeling. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's such a good one. I, that reminds me of, um, the worry appointment that we've talked about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. I recently implemented something in my business that is kind of like a business worry appointment. And, um, this was like a, a while back. My therapist at some point was just like, Hey, just have like a worry appointment scheduled in your calendar. So when you start to worry about things, you can tell yourself, wait a minute, I have today at 3 p.m. to worry for 15 minutes. And what usually happens by the time, you know, the 3 p.m. appointment or whatever time your appointment comes around, you usually don't feel like you have to worry about anything because you've kind of tricked your brain. And I've implemented this in my business too, where now I just, when I think about it, a business idea or something I want to tell my team about, or like that, it just decreases the urgency by just saying, oh, you know what? I'm going to do that little check-in every Monday and I'll just save it for like my Monday list. And, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I meet very intentionally. Oh my God, that has been such a game changer just for my own anxiety. And I oh. wish I had gotten that tip in my twenties. <laughs> I wish yeah. I had gotten something just very simple and tangible to like implement of like, Hey, nobody's telling you not to worry. You're just kind of being a little bit more organized about your worrying. Yeah. And, uh, it kind of just like, yeah, it's just like a, it's a great mind fuck. I feel like it's true. Yeah. Because nobody has ever, I don't think benefited from being told like, Oh, just don't worry about it. Right. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much. Right. It's like never has that worked for me, but it's nice when you don't dismiss your feelings. It's like, well, if you are feeling anxious about something, okay, well let's deal with that. But uh, yeah, having some boundaries with yourself. Definitely. Yeah. For me, I feel like having those years of having really bad anxiety felt like I had no boundaries with myself. I had no control over those thoughts. It just was like, they kind of ran my emotions right. and it was, ex- I was exhausting. I was exhausting on myself. It was exhausting on the people close to me. I think, it, you know, it just, it was tough. 
Yeah, totally. Well, this is probably a good kind of spinoff of anxiety, just like overall health. Like if we did like a little health audit from our twenties versus thirties or like how we approach it. Oh my God. I mean, in my twenties, my, anything about self-care health, whatever, it was so bottom of my priority list. It was so much on the back burner in so many ways. And now that is actually a huge shift. It is the top. It went from like the very bottom to the very top. Wow. And that was probably the hardest shift. And I, and it's unfortunate that that's like a hard shift. Yeah. Um, but that has really been a game changer where I just, I take care of myself before I dive into anything else now. And that yeah. was just, you know, if you've been tuning into the podcast for a while, like, man, I was, yeah, big time workaholic, always on the go involved in too many different things, just not being intentional or present or mindful about like any of the moves that I was making. I just Mm -hmm. remember in my twenties, not even knowing truly not even being connected enough to myself to like, know what I liked or disliked. Like, Mm -hmm. I just remember looking around my room one day and being like, I don't even like this artwork that's on the wall. How did this fucking get here? You know, just like those conversations of like, who am I? And what am I doing? Who am I doing this for? What am I doing this for? Why am I running myself so ragged? Where is this coming from? And uh, I wish I, I wish I could have had those ah ahas a lot sooner. I mean, I'm happy where I am now, but you know, if we can help people avoid some of those pitfalls. um, Yeah. Great. That's so funny with the artwork thing. I think that's really common for a lot of people that we start to outgrow our current self. Yeah. But our environment doesn't reflect it. I know I was like, you know, there and there's still some art on my walls that I look at where I'm like, "Ah, I could probably let go of some of that. But I would just move from each apartment and kind of keep the same decor with me. It wouldn't really update with my personal growth. Same with clothes. You keep certain outfits where you put them on and it's like, gosh, this feels like old me. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and we're, I know that you're so big on thrifting and we're not saying go necessarily buy a bunch of shit, but it's just like, maybe be mindful of, of what your environment is. And if that feels like you. Oh, it's so fucking good. And I feel like a lot of people would be surprised that I prioritize that so much yeah. with, with um, curating the things in my environment. I never used to do that. I exactly yeah. what you said, Kels. It's just like, oh, I have this, this person, piece of furniture, this clothing that somebody gave me, this will last me another decade. I'm good. Like I don't need to right. shop. I don't need to pick things out. And it was a big realization. And, and it was kind of like going back to that moment, looking at the art on my walls and stuff is like, nothing was picked out by me. Wow. Nothing was like, most things were not picked out by me. They were things given to me by other people or whatever. And I'm like, if I chose my surroundings or if I chose my clothing or if I chose my this, like, what would I choose? Do I even know what I like in that area? What are my tastes? And so this actually happened not too long ago. Anytime I feel like I've experienced some kind of growth or I feel like this is a new direction or a new level of my business or personally or whatever, I have to update my environment. It is like such a huge priority. Oh, interesting. And I have to, I love the symbolism of like, Hey, remember you're like in a new, a new space oh, now and a new mm-hmm. reality. And I, it makes me not forget so easily. I literally, this happened maybe a few months ago. They were going through some transitions in like my business and stuff. And I was like, I have to clear my whole schedule today because I need to decorate my house. Like that's the most yeah. important thing I need to decorate. There's some things I got to update. There's some things that I need to do to make me feel better in my environment before I can even move on to like this other, these other things on my task list. Yeah. And, oh my God. It makes such a huge difference. And I feel like, you know, people knowing that I'm a minimalist would be really surprised to hear how much I prioritize the stuff that is in my. Yeah. Space. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, and I'm now looking around like, oh, and I'm itching to change some things now <laughs> that I've just kept, uh, out of habit or, or whatever, but yeah, yeah, it's, I think it is important to have that stuff reflect who you are. And you're talking about prioritizing, prioritizing your health. I think in your twenties, a lot of the time financially, we're not always in a place where we feel super secure to, 
go get a massage, to go do those sort of health things that make yeah. us feel taken care of and pampered. Yeah. And sometimes, at least my mindset used to be like, well, if I can't do the highest form of self-care that I want to do, I'm just not going to do anything. Oh, it was a little bit like all or nothing. Kind all of or thing. nothing. It just felt, um, I, I don't know if I thought it was like a waste of time to do like DIY things or or whatever, but I just would, yeah, encourage everybody to like, even if you're not in a position right now to do the treat yourselves that you want to do, there are, there are so many things you can do that are super budget friendly or even free, just, just taking walks, really committing to meditating or journaling, whatever you find works for you. I know that you love to take baths, Del. Yeah. Stuff like that. Just, yeah, that, that quote, the whole, um, if you don't take care of your wellness, you'll be forced to take care of your illness. Yes. And it's like, just try to try to keep yourself going day to day, even just whatever you can do in that day. That's such a good point, dude, because I think, you know, my, my mindset also used to just be like, when I get there, then I'll take care of myself and celebrate. It was like, I'm not, I'm not there yet. So I'm not going to reward myself yet. And now anytime I feel like I'm catching myself in that, I just stop and I immediately, I got to do something good for myself. Like that moment, that day, that hour, I'm like, I, nope, that's no longer the mindset or the mentality. And for me, like once I started kind of upgrading my environment and you can really do this on any budget, it was like, sometimes I would just move my furniture around. And like, I remember just like, putting like a a blanket that was in my closet on top of the chair. And that made the chair look a little bit nicer. You know, we talked about like those things and you just don't realize how much your environment is draining you until it's like you upgrade it in some way. You're like, wow, I just feel so good in my space. And like, it could be something so simple, like a $10, like doorknob that you, yeah. that you put on your door. Yes. It's like, you know, maybe your other one was like cracked and broken. And every time you saw it, it made you feel like shit. Like you weren't killing it at your life or whatever. Right. And yes. it's, it's, and, or subconsciously, you're not even realizing that that fucking broken doorknob is draining you every single day. And it's right. like $10 upgrade can go a long way for yeah. your mindset. And now I'm like, Ooh, I'm like addicted to it. I update shit consistently. Yeah. And I love it. But well, once you start and you start to notice it more, mm-hmm. um, definitely one of, uh, the next things on my list that also was really up there with the anxiety stuff was understanding in my thirties, the importance of loving yourself and having a really solid relationship with yourself. And I think, a lot of us can confuse people loving us with us loving ourselves Mm -hmm. because you can feel loved by a lot of people in your life and think that that's the same thing as you loving yourself. And it's not. And, um, I, I really took time and, um, it, it took a lot of work, but I realized how uncomfortable I was with loving myself. When TikTok was getting really big, there was a a creator on there, and I'm forgetting her name, but I know we we talked about her on an episode where she was really encouraging people to do mirror talk, basically, where it's like you wake up, you look in the mirror, and say ten self love affirmations to yourself. Yeah. And God, that was so uncomfortable for me mm-hmm. at first to really look at myself and not be cynical or think it was corny or just outright reject it. And it just, yeah, like it, af- after a certain amount of time, it really started to sink in and um, like living on my own for a while has also really helped with that. And I'm not saying that you need to be out of a relationship to learn how to love yourself. I think you can totally do that while you're in one. I just think it is important to to take a step back and make sure that you do actually have a solid relationship with yourself. Because if you don't, I do think it can like leak into other parts of your life. Oh yeah. So good, dude. So, so good. I just, a big difference. Like, I mean, really so many things are just the complete opposite for me. I I just feel like almost an opposite person. (laughs) Um, Uh, Yeah. 
uh, one of the big things just kind of off of that, like self-love and maybe even insecurity and all that, I just felt like I was letting everybody else dictate things I was doing. Not even like they were doing things maliciously, but anybody's opinion or idea or thought about what I should do versus what I shouldn't do. I just kind of took it face value. And I just did that thing. Like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I should do. This is what everybody's doing around me. So every, all of my decisions and actions were based on external factors. I was not like advising myself internally with anything. Yes. Um, Yes. And that's part of that. I think too, is just not being connected with your own inner voice or yeah. maybe noticing that your self-talk is actually very, very negative. And you're like, what, why are you saying this to yourself? Like, exactly. why are you being so mean? If you're not going to be nice to you, nobody's going to be nice to you. Like you got to be nice to you. Exactly. And now it's like, I don't, I only, I go internally and I might ask a few, a few intentional people about something, but that's like it. I'm not looking for answers like all over outside of me anymore. No. Oh my way. God. And oh, yeah. Yes. And what a big one. That's such a big one. That's a big one for me too. Yeah. And then you, you start to realize who is this advice coming from? Who are these people that are giving you all these different opinions? And when I actually started like the practice of actually looking at who was giving me the advice and what, what that, that might be stemming from. It's like, yeah, I wouldn't trade places with this person. I don't want what they have. So the advice that they're giving me, like, that's just irrelevant to like what I'm doing. And so I, I think I'm just more uncomfortable. I are, I'm more comfortable now than I was, uh, with just being like disliked. I I had a really hard time if somebody disliked me in my twenties and I would people please and do a lot of things to like, you know, rectify that. And now I'm just like, I truly don't give a shit because 99.9% of the opinions I would never trade places with. So let me Mm -hmm. go to the 1% of people or advisors or whatever that I actually want to do what they've done. And let me listen to those people. And then let me listen to myself and find like, what's actually true for me. Yeah. That has been such a game changer. And I mean, seriously, it's changed my life when you really just think about like, who am I trying to do all this for? And please. And right. It's yeah. Weird. And I think that also connects with making sure you really actually love yourself because when I didn't have that full on unconditional love uh, in my relationship with myself, I didn't trust myself either. And that's when I would also look to external sources for validation, for just like making sure that I was, uh, that like my opinion on, like I could, I just couldn't trust myself with my comedy, with anything. I was always like, wait, do you think that's funny? Wait, what do you think of that? What like, I I had zero, (laughs) nothing was going in. I needed so much from the outside. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a big one. Um, Yeah. I feel like, yeah, totally more connected to my intuition. I don't push it down anymore. If I have a weird yeah. feeling about something, I just listen to it. I don't question it. I just kind yeah. of move on. I, I, if I had just listened to a lot of my inner voice in my twenties, there's a lot of things I could have just avoided by just having that self-trust. Like you mentioned, Kels, like, yeah, it's just so huge and, uh, strengthening that and actually spending time on that sitting quietly in a room and like having some kind of spiritual practice or mindfulness practice or whatever it is that you like to do. Um, a lot of answers will come to you that way without having to, to look outside of you. So yeah, that's been a big one for sure. Yeah. Um, how this is a big one because we have talked about compulsive working on this podcast and we're very type A and we got perfectionistic mm-hmm. stuff. How has your relationship with work changed from your twenties to thirties and what priorities kind of have been built around that? Oh my gosh. Well, that's on my list is, um, that I now look at my day and my schedule in terms of energy, not in time. And I know we've mentioned that before on the show, but rather than looking at a day where, you know, maybe I'm waking up at eight, going to bed at 10 and seeing however many hours are in between that, that are open rather than going, Ooh, well, I could do 22 things. Uh, It's like, yeah, but what, how much energy does each of those things take? And I almost have like a little sliding scale. Now, when I build my schedule out for the week, it's like, 
some of these things, even if they're like an hour, like podcasting, for example. Yeah. yeah. Podcasting takes more energy for me than um, maybe like sending a business email. Right. 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 So it's like just ma- making sure that whatever I've got planned for the day, I know you and I talk a lot about um, how differently we, we feel about getting our hair done. We're like, oh, yeah. we're always like, oh my God, it's so, it just drains me so stressful. And yeah. you know, it's funny. I do really love that like pampering experience, but it is an incredibly draining. It's almost like a three hour podcast. Oh yeah. Like it's a, it's a nonstop conversation with your hairdresser. And um, yeah. so days like that, I'm always very mindful of like, okay, if you're getting your hair done, you're going to be sitting in that chair for three hours, nonstop talking. Do not plan to do a ton of other things that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because even if you've got the whole afternoon free, you're probably not going to energetically be able to do a bunch of other shit. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, oh yeah. my gosh. This, this one is, this feels for me like I look at quality versus quantity now in pretty much every area of my life. Yeah. In my twenties, it was like, as if I could get as much done as humanly possible in a day, I felt like that would get me towards like my goals or more clarity quicker. And it was actually when I started prioritizing like the quality things or tasks on my list or whatever that so much opened up and and all of that. And so now I just look at like, yeah, what's the least amount I need to do to get to like the next step instead of jam packing the schedule. And like, as soon as you wake up, it's like the clock, you know, you're the, the yes. smart clock, you know, and you're just yes. trying to race around, and get as much done as you, you possibly can. And you think that's going to like get you somewhere. And for me, at least it just only brought me burnout and confusion and frustration and, and all that. And so such a big difference, just yeah. the quality over the quantity um, and I, I'd much rather do a few things really well and very intentionally than 10 things half-assed. And I was just, I was the half-assed queen back then. I'll just, I just got to show up and do it and see you later. And <laughs> hopefully at something, something will stick at some point and then I'll, I'll have a clue as to what the fuck to do. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. But no, it didn't work that way for me. I had to actually stop and intentionally say, nope, I'm not going to do any of this shit over here. I'm going to just do these things. And like, I had to choose my path. I thought the path would be like revealed to me. If I kept trying a million things and burning myself out, somebody would grant me some fucking, I don't know, um, permission or something that I was looking for to move forward in some way. But I actually had to give myself the permission and say, nope, this is the path I've chosen. I'm going to pour all of my energy into these things. And that's when it all happened. I, I was, again, I was like giving away my power to somebody else and just completely took that back, you know? Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, another one that really popped up for me when I was thinking about priority shifts in twenties versus thirties or lessons, um, is the idea that we shouldn't, well, I don't want to say shouldn't, because I know that word is like, (laughs) but I think it's good to not assume that the emotional value you place on something is the same as somebody else. Oh, yes. Because, and I, I think of that a lot when it comes to um, romantic relationships with like love language and communication style and all that. But we're at, we're at a time now where a lot of people are dating online or even if they don't meet online, a lot of the communication starts through texting, right? Yeah. And, um, I've had conversations with friends where it's so funny where like they will be going through, they'll be like basically reading me their text conversation with somebody. And they're like, I mean, I don't want to spend my hour of therapy decoding this with my therapist because it feels so silly. But like, what do you think of their response or like their response time versus mine? And, Mm. And I completely understand how there's part of us that probably still feels silly to want to spend time in therapy doing it. But the reality is that a lot of people are dealing with communication in a way that is like so different as humans than we've ever really dealt with before. And things do come into play like um, misreading somebody's tone in a text 
yeah. or uh, yeah, maybe their response time is longer than yours is or vice versa. Maybe you take longer to respond than they do. And they're assuming, oh, maybe this person isn't as invested or doesn't feel the way I do. And I think love language aside, you know, from texting and stuff like that, just people showing up and doing things that the other person can't even process is like, oh, this is how they're showing me affection. If they're not being given affection in their specific love language, it can kind of fall flat and not really be um, not be as impactful maybe to the person. And I think people struggle with that a lot where then there's there's resentment or fear of moving forward. And that's just something that I have noticed um, in my relationships as well as my friends is taking a step back and going, okay like you can't assume that this person's way of operating is the same as yours. And that it means the same thing because we all come from completely different backgrounds. We all express ourselves completely differently. Oh my God. So true. So, so true. Um, This actually recently happened. I was having a conversation. I was, I texted somebody um, in Cam's family and we were talking about something. Um, and I forgot to mention like, oh, this is like part of my five-year plan. Right. So like when I was asking a question, they were under the the assumption, they were making an assumption that I was like looking into doing something like right now. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be the next few years. And so Cam was like, oh, they probably think that because that's how I operate. I'm not a planner. I don't plan Um, ahead. And so by you saying that they're probably looking through the lens of like what I do. And so by being around me my whole life, they're thinking that this is like a decision you're about to make like today, but knowing you and the way that your family responded to this conversation, they know that you're a planner and you're thinking about like three, five, 10 years from now. And so it was like, Oh, how interesting. Like, you know, even like the people that you're around, if, if they're used to responding certain ways, you might think that everybody is under that kind of same like lens of thinking. Um, mm-hmm. But I just thought that literally just happened a, a, within a couple of days. Like, oh yeah, I guess I, I didn't even think to preface, oh, this is like part of my five-year plan. I'm just like, hey, do you have some time to talk about this topic? And yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, even that it's like, oh yeah, communication is so important because everybody's coming with to the table with their own experiences and their own way of doing things and planning things and thinking about things. And I just like, yeah, just wasn't even on my radar to think that because my family knows how I operate and Cam's family knows how he operates and we're very different styles. Right. (laughs) Right. Which is, isn't that one of the four agreements is like, don't take things personally or like that. And I think, and I think don't make assumptions, right? Don't make assumptions. assumptions. Maybe that's the, and maybe personally as well. That could be. Yeah. And I think also, um, not assuming that in a romantic relationship that you and your partner move at the same pace. Right. And also not taking that personally. Right. You know, that's a big, I've learned that sometimes the opposite is true. Like Mm -hmm. um, if you've been used to relationships where the other person really like steps on the gas and wants things to move very quickly Oftentimes, that's not necessarily the healthiest situation. Right. Um, there are exceptions to that, but in general. And um, then like being in a relationship then moves more slowly, even though that might feel differently for you, it uh, can ultimately be like the, the much healthier thing. It just might not be what you're used to. So, yeah. Yes. How has your relationship changed with free time and like downtime and stuff? I know for me, twenties versus thirties, I felt like because I was such a workaholic and so burnt out, (laughs) it almost like annoyed me to see other people like just doing like mundane things. Yeah. That's really tough to admit that. But because I was, I didn't realize I was doing it to myself. I felt like somebody else was doing this to me that I was so busy and all over the place. And I'm like, wow, it must be nice to just have free time and downtime and be able to like 
bake cookies on the weekends. Like I can't do that. But really I was, I was putting the responsibility on somebody else. I could have absolutely done those things. Yeah. I was choosing not to, I was just stuck in this loop of feeling like I I can't do that, but in reality I could. And I was choosing to overwork and get myself involved in a million different things. And so now it's like, wow, I have more free time than I do work time. And that is such a huge shift because it used to be like work was like my life and my identity. And now work is just like something I do. And it's not, it's like, you know, the pie chart, it's such a smaller piece of that pie. And yeah, I felt like work was really like, it dictated so many things about how I felt about myself and making that little pie piece smaller it's like if something is, t- is is tough at work or something's going on that's stressful, there's yeah. just so much more of that pie to look forward to and enjoy that yeah. it just doesn't bother me as much. It's not like the focal point of my life. It's like something that fuels my life instead of like defines me. And that that's been huge. Yeah. I just realized I, how that was affecting me. Yeah. I think that's the biggest change I've seen in you for yeah. sure is that shift. Yeah. It's a major shift. Yeah. It's like when you're so closely wrapped in your work and your self-worth, it's like every, any little thing can really be tough. And I'm like, yeah. okay, things are tough at work. That doesn't say anything about me or my character or me as a person or yeah. how good I am at my job or, you know, whatever. Like, it's just a, it's a tough detachment to have. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's something I think I'm continuing to work on. I think it's gotten better since my twenties, but just like being like really appreciating peace. And Taylor had sent me um, a great excerpt from a book that was like talking about a life of too much motion. And she and I were just saying like, oh my God, we relate so much to this that sometimes if your life involves going all the time, it does feel hard to appreciate just sitting down. You would think you would, right? You would think it'd be so easy to be like, oh my God, thank God I could just take a break for a second. But if you're used to that kind of steady dose of adrenaline all the time, it can feel uncomfortable to just be quiet and, and not have the stimulation of your phone or, or making way too many plans or, you know, that's, that's something I'm trying to still work on. It's, it's not always easy for me. Oh, same here. I mean, part of why I used to like being so busy is because when I was quiet and I like had to sit my sit with myself, I just realized how sad I was. And I wanted to avoid that feeling. I felt very lost and confused and like no direction. I just feel like I didn't have a direction. And so it was really easy to avoid that if I had a bazillion things on my to-do list that day. (laughs) And it's like, oh, it can be hard to sit with your emotions and, uh, now it's like, yeah, just, I, I do things a little bit differently when I'm feeling stressed or like upset about something. I don't just like pile a bunch of things on my list. I'm like, okay, yeah. I think I actually need to do the opposite and have a little bit more free time <laughs> right yes. now to do that. Um, another like big shift. And I feel like priority wise too, is that I used to n- really not invest in myself. I, I just did not invest in myself. I had no problem in investing in other people or like, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, like no problem. Didn't have to think about buying somebody a nice gift or doing this for somebody or whatever. But when it came to like doing something for myself, I really, really struggled with it. And now I just, I love it. I love doing that stuff for myself. Um, yeah. And I realized like, yeah, I mean, v- investing in myself has been like the best ROI, you know, it's yeah. like in, in everything in, in time, in, in mental health and business growth and personal growth. Um, but that's been a huge change to, I, I just can't believe that at some point, like I really had to check my bank account to see if I could afford to get guacamole on my burrito at Chipotle with my friend, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and now it's yeah. like, um, I'm very grateful that I'm in a different position financially and can spend more freely on myself, on other people, on like contributing to causes I like where the, the, the men, the money mentality I used to have was very yeah. like. I'm in survival mode and I really only have the capacity to worry about my own needs financially. And now being in like a more of a thriving mode where I'm like, wow, I, 
all this opens up to where I actually, my, I'm covered and I can actually look at what else I want to spend yeah. money on. Like that's a freaking game changer too. Yeah. And if you're in your twenties and you are in a place right now financially that you don't want to be, and you feel like you're kind of having to live in that scarcity mindset, just know that like anything is possible. Truly. I, yeah. I used to be like, fuck, I don't know. It, sometimes it's hard to even picture a different life for yourself if you've never gotten to live it. Right. And just know, like, try to have an abundance mindset as much as you can. Try to just be really open minded and you would be shocked at what can happen. So. Oh, my God. What I'd love to add to that. And this is what I wish I would have known in my 20s. For me, making money is a skill like anything else. If I could have gotten that fucking advice in my 20s, the way that you might take lessons to like learn the piano or practice a little bit every day to learn the piano or whatever, any skill that you have put time and energy into, money is the same thing. It's like no different. I used to think it was like this mystical beast, you know, of a fucking unicorn of like, only the lucky people get to have money and only the very special talented people, mm-hmm. you know, either had to be like a celebrity or a doctor. I wasn't going to do any of those. So I was fucked. No, I really wish I would have said it's way more practical and methodical than you realize. And it's not a unicorn. And if you spend time and energy doing it and learning how to do it and add value to like whatever work you're doing and learn how to invest and all that stuff, you can do it. It's not a scary thing. And I think women have been left out of that. Women have been left out of the financial conversation for so long. And I'm really trying to turn that around in like my own business, especially is let's just take the emotion out of that shit. It is a skill. That's it. It's all good. Yeah. You can do it. You can learn it. Yeah. You know, true. Yeah. 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 And that's it for me. Whew, yeah, we could, we could all day for this. <laughs> I know that was fun. Um, <laughs> you have a segment. I have a quick little thing I can share. Um, yes, I. It was Cam's birthday not too long ago, and I hired a magician to give us a private magic show uh, in one of my family's homes, and it was so much fun. It was well, the same magician at my wedding. Oh my god, amazing! <laughs> yeah. So uh, this guy's incredible. I hired him for my for my bachelorette party for our wedding, and then I surprised Cam with like a private magic show. We really love magic. It's like one of our most favorite forms of entertainment. Yeah. And um, that was just so fun. And um, yeah, I'm just like enjoying like what kind of fun experience could be like simple to throw together that we can just do from the comfort of our own homes. God, I sound so old, but like I don't have to go anywhere. I can just (laughs) hire people to come to us. (laughs) Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, so that was really fun. Um, Yeah, he, he told us that my bachelorette party was like the first ever bachelorette party that he did magic at and that his friends were like do they know you're a magician and nothing else like why is this person hiring a magician for their bachelorette party yeah and I was like well they don't know I'm a fucking nerd so maybe you just tell them that next time but yeah oh my god highly recommend if you're looking for entertainment for an event get a great magician oh yeah it's a good time holy shit that's so (laughs) funny I know they're like dude are you like, do they expect to see your dick? Because yes. is that part of pulling something yeah. out of a hat? Uh, yeah, what is happening? Extra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's awesome. I had um, a quick little skincare hack or find. I don't know. Um, it's been trending on TikTok, and I've been doing it for the past couple weeks now. Um, a dermatologist has started to go viral on TikTok talking about skin cycling. And so what she recommends is that um, on on the start of it, you use an acid product. So like an AHA, BHA, glycolic, whatever sort of acid peel or pad you like to use. And then the next night you use your retinol product and then nights three and four, you let your skin rest. So you just moisturize, you don't do any treatments and then you start back over. So then day five, acid treatment, six retinol. Anyway, it's supposed to line up with kind of your skin's natural cycle of of the turnover and and all that. And my skin has really been loving it. Um, I've really felt like it just agrees with, with my skin. It feels like that's what my skin has wanted. And I just haven't known that there was like an optimal 
order, I guess, in the week of like when to do things. So anyway, I just wanted to, those of you who like nice. skincare and, and are always looking to improve shit, I would say give it a try. I've been really liking Hot it. Hot tip. Hot tip yeah. indeed. Um, we do have an iTunes review of the episode. This is from Annie Lizzie. Is that what that says, Kels? Annie Lizzie. Lizzie? Lizzle, I think. Yeah. Lizzle. Okay. Annie Lizzle. It says, helplessly devoted. Absolutely love this podcast. I listen every week. The girls are hilarious and inspirational. Thank you for the variety of topics. Thank you so much. I love helplessly devoted. I know. I love that. <laughs> Man, thank you, you Annie. So? <laughs> yeah. Thank it. you so much. Thank you for taking the time. Really means a lot to us. Yeah. That's it's a quick thing to do and it's free and it helps the show a lot. So thank you for doing it. Yeah. And um Gosh, see you in Atlanta this weekend. Hopefully some helpsters go to KelseyCook.com, get tour date tickets. Yeah. yeah. DelaneyFisher.com for the minimalist business podcast. Love to have you over there. Sweet. All right, guys. Happy Halloween. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for listening to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and our individual work at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you shared this episode with a friend or feel free to post it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say thank you. Thank you.